uh, this lecture and it will be posted later on Canvas. Okay, so we did all of our introductions and we did everything last on Tuesday, last time we were together. And today we're going to start talking about profiling and criminal profiling. And what is a criminal profile? Okay. Uh, Joseph Conrad said that the belief is a supernatural in a supernatural source of evil is not necessary. Men alone are quite capable of every wickedness there is. Okay. And as a profiler, we have to figure out who the wicked is. It's a direct Aaron contrast. Lowe is now joining. Always freaks me out. Okay, so in direct contrast, Jacques Rousseau, or Jean Jacques Rousseau, said that there is no evil man on the planet and that all men can be made good. Profiling tells us something different because we find that there is evil in the world and evil can be identified and identified within man. And if you just look at what's going on here over the last couple months, you know, we've seen that there's been a lot of people doing a lot of horribly, horrible things. Uh, and I'm thinking in the next couple of weeks, you're going to start seeing a lot of people being arrested for child pornography, human trafficking, uh, sexual assault on children. And these could be names that are familiar to you. So the history of profiling, and it's not updating there. So, all right, there's the quote from Joseph Conrad. In case you wanted to write it down. The history of profiling goes all the way back to the 1400s. Okay, the first instruction book on profiling was written by some Dominican monks uh, titled Malleus Malficarum. And I always have a hard time. Nadia, are you seeing my screen now? Uh, let me. <clears throat> About now, Nadia. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> okay, so. What this book, the uh, Malleus, is, is a book to how to interrogate, identify, interrogate, and investigate witches. And this was the book that was used all the way up through the Salem <coughs> Witch Trials in the 1640s. For over 200 years, this was the groundswell. This was the Bible. Uh, for a lack of a better term, on criminal profiling and how to profile a witch. Okay. The most modern version comes from Edgar Allan Poe. You guys remember Edgar Allan Poe from English class? Uh, did you guys get to read or were you required to read The Murders in the Rome Morgue? Right. Put it on your reading list. Uh, 
Joel, can you get that door for me, please? Thank you. And then the most famous of all criminal profilers is Sherlock Holmes. It's elementary, my dear Watson. Uh, he was a Scotland Yard, and it was actually Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was an investigator with Scotland Yard. And like a lot of people, they take their real life and turn it into fiction. This has morphed into what we see today. And we all like these shows, right? Criminal Minds. I don't like the way the show ended. But anyway, real crime profiles, the first 24, the first 48. Uh, suspect behavior, books. And I know a lot of you mentioned last week that you like reading true crime. You like watching true crime on Netflix and other things. This has given a mystique of the criminal profiler that they are somehow smarter than your average person. Okay. This is a mixture between real profilers and the art profilers. The guy in front and center, this guy right here, his name is Jim Ryder. He died about seven years ago of uh, liver cancer or liver disease. But when I was teaching at my last Texas school, I was teaching at I had a crime lab and my criminal investigations class would have to go solve this crime. And I would set it up based upon historical crimes and counting on the fact that my students were not heavy readers. So they may or may not know the crimes. And he would walk in and he would stand in the middle of the crime scene that I had created. He'd walk or he'd turn around a full 360 degrees, fully standing. And then he'd crouch and do the same thing. Then he'd grab a chair and stand on the chair and do the same thing. And within 20 minutes, he told me everything that happened in that crime scene. In order. How did he get to do that? How did he get to be that impressive with his criminal profiling skills? First, he'd been doing it for 25 years and I wouldn't expect nothing less. But second, he said, I read. I always read. And that's why I asked you about reading last week. Because it is important that you read. But do criminal profilers make mistakes? Yes. These are a couple of the biggest mistakes that they make. The Beltway Snipers. The Beltway Snipers, we were told that they were disgruntled military veterans. They were white in their mid-30s. They were decorated Desert Storm veterans. And that they were working out of a white panel bread truck. When it came out, we actually found out who did it. They were halfway right. There was Lee Boyd Malvo and John Allen Mohammed. Um, the older guy, um, Malvo, was a decorated veteran of the military. Uh, they did get the race wrong. They were working out of an Impala. They were not working out of a van. We make mistakes basically because we're human. Okay, the other horrible, horrible mistake we made was the Olympic Park abortion clinic bomber. Okay. Uh, Richard Jewell fit the profile that the FBI came up with. They said that this guy had a hero complex. He believed that he would set off a bomb and he would come save the day. And Richard Jewell was a security guard. He was a hired security guard in Olympic Park in Atlanta. And he's the guy that found an unexploded bomb. And then they targeted him. You may have recently seen the movie, Jewel, and how the press absolutely destroyed his life. He is still not recovered. When in actuality, it was Eric Rudolph who was a prepper and a survivalist and he was 
part, he was known as a sovereign citizen. Profilers are human. We are not mystics. We are not the end all be all. We do make mistakes, but we follow. We try to follow the evidence and we try to follow what has happened in the past. The mad bomber George Metesky uh, was a bomber who he was a mass serial killer, a serial bomber, which I thought and he would taunt the press, he would taunt the media, he would send letters. Um, it was suspected and the profile brought up that he was a paranoid schizophrenic who believed that somebody or some entity was controlling and plotting against him. Okay. Much like that uh, conspiracy group called the QAnon. You guys been hearing a lot about QAnon here of late? On the media and the news? Even President Trump was asked about QAnon. You guys, does anybody know anything about, heard anything about QAnon? Okay, Larissa, and for those of you that were late, um, I am changing the way that I take attendance because I'm recording these videos and in order to protect with FERPA, I'm not going to take an actual role. I need you to send me an email uh, sometime today with the attendance keyword, secret <coughs> keyword of criminal minds. So if you send me an email saying, I was here today, criminal minds, and I'll make sure that I've marked you present. Okay, so the profiler said when you catch him, and Dr. Brussel was a psychologist, and they brought all of the information that they had, and that's this picture here. This was all the evidence that they had on the mad bomber, and he was blowing up buildings in association with the Connecticut Electrical Company. Um, According to his writings, Dr. Brussel said that when you arrest him, he'll be wearing a double breasted suit and it will be fully buttoned. And this is a picture of George in his double breasted suit, which is fully buttoned. And God brought him out of his mother's attic. I'm not attic basement. Okay. You guys read about this in your book? Oh, well, there is a fight over who really solved the crime. Was it Dr. Brussel or was it a secretary? Alice Kelly was a filing clerk at Consolidated Edison, which is the electric company. Uh, and she brought to attention that George McKeska had been sending threat emails continuously to Con Ed. And because, and then she sent the police looking in his direction. And then the Journal Americana also said, uh, well, no, we're responsible. So there's been a big fight over who solved the mad bomber. Uh, James Brussel became very wealthy off of his political, not his political, but his profile. So how do you become a great profiler? You read. If you were sitting waiting for somebody, like we have to wait to come into this class, you need to be reading something. Not playing on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or Instagram or whatever social media things that you work on. You need to be reading something. I do my best to read one academic journal article every single day. And I'm currently working on a book called The Encyclopedia of Hate. And this is the book I'm reading. And in addition to the textbooks, I'm also reading this book. And it's called Homegrown Revolutionaries, an American Militia Reader. And what this is, it's just a series of journal articles and reports and newspaper articles about the different militia found within the United States and their, their claims. It's written by them, from them. It's not CNN's analysis. It's not some academic 
like me, my analysis, it's their words. It's what they have to say. So if you're getting the words from the individuals themselves, should that make let you know a little bit more about the militia? Yes. I'm also working on a new research project about this law enforcement's perception of the right wing militia and their threat to domestic security. You guys hear what happened in Kenosha yesterday? Not yesterday, but the night before. The militia member killed two people and injured in the third. The guy that got shot in the bicep? The guy who got shot in the bicep was one of the militia members' victims. Was he a 17-year-old boy? He was a 17-year-old boy, child. He was not legally allowed to possess a long gun. Because you have to be 18 to possess a long gun. Um, he was protecting a business and he with several other different militia members. And a guy came up to him and pointed a gun in his face. And the militia member, I think his, uh, I don't remember his name, the militia member leveled off and shot the guy in the head. Well, the mob saw it and they started to chase him down. They chased him down. Uh, the guy that was shot in the bicep smashed him upside the head with a skateboard, put him on the ground. A third guy, started to punch him in the face uh, with a lead pipe. Militia guy shot him in the chest and killed him and then shot the third guy uh, in the bicep. Uh, and last I heard, he's gonna lose his arm. Guy gets up and he runs some more. He goes home to Illinois and he was arrested yesterday at two counts of first degree murder and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Need to read more, especially if you want to become a good profiler. Because not just nonfiction. You want to read everything, anything. I think I even, well, I don't, I didn't put it here. But as much as I hate the books, even Twilight or the Wizard dude, what's his name? Harry po Harry Potter. Okay. Just read. If you are not, if you're just sitting around waiting for somebody, if you're bored because, you know, you're tired of watching the 1980s NBA, read a book. I know we just started the, pro, the playoffs, and I don't think, how many games did they even, the NBA get put in this year? I don't think they put in a whole lot, and... The Milwaukee team is already talking about boycotting playoff games. Did they just start with the playoffs? Yeah. Read. The irrationality of a thing is not an argument against its existence, but a condition of it. What does that mean? Lack of belief in whatever doesn't mean that you're completely against it, but rather certain aspects of it. One more time. The belief in whatever. Right. X. Um, whether the lack of isn't denying its existence, but rather because you disagree with a certain aspect. Okay, so let me get it. Regardless of how irrational the idea of racism or systemic racism, that's a nice controversial topic, yes? The argument against the existence of systemic racism does not prove or show that systemic racism does not exist, it actually proves that it does. Because if you're arguing against it and against its existence, it supports the condition of it. Okay. Nietzsche, how I pronounce his name, Frederick Nietzsche, um, 
was also a staunch atheist and fought religiously against the existence of God. Following his own logic, he proved that God exists, right? Because, and if the atheists say, well, God doesn't exist, you can't prove it, blah, blah, blah. Well, you're arguing about something that doesn't exist. That means in its, just in its pure logic, it exists. So when you hear Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and me argue that systemic racism does not exist, according to Nietzsche, it proves that or it's a condition that it does exist and that there is some form of whatever it is. So as criminal profilers, we want to establish what is deviant. And I know the screen tells you, uh, but what is deviance? How would you define deviance? Something that goes against the norm. Goes against the norm. Okay. Um, I've got some bad pictures coming here pretty quick. But the fact or the state of departing from the usual or accepted standards, especially in a social or sexual behavior. Deviance is determined by the group. And so we as a community, we as a society, determine what is and what is not deviant. And do the standards of decency or the standards of deviance change over time? Yes, they do. Deviance is a judgment of an act or a judgment of a behavior. It is something that's established by society. And as profilers, we look for deviance in that behavior. And then we look for identifying factors within that behavior. Okay, so there are four different types of deviance that we find uh, within society. There's the statistical deviance where the common conditions determine what is normal or not normal or non-deviant. And then the statistical minority represents that deviance. So the research project I just finished shows that there are 10 million people arrested by the police every single year. Of that 10 million felony arrests, 1,000 suspects were killed. And we just had another one on Sunday, yes? Jacob Blake, or yeah, Blake, was just killed on Sunday night. So, my word of advice to you today, and this should have been given to you by your parents, it does not matter what the color of your skin is, you could be black, brown, white, blue, green, orange, yellow, whatever the color of your skin. If you want to die today, I'll tell you how to do it. Go get pulled over by a cop. Backmouth that cop. Fight that cop. Assault that cop. Refuse to do what that cop tells you to do. Lunge or reach for a weapon and you will die today. Because what the cops do, cops want to go home too, right? Every day I went to work, I wanted to go home at the end of the day. I feel threatened. I'm going to use whatever force I deem necessary to make sure that my child gets to see me today. So how do you make sure you get to go home to see your child today? The easiest way to go home and not die. The cop says do this, do that. If you think it's wrong, you can fight about it later. Your job, your only job, your only obligation is to go home to your family at the end of every day.
If you want to not go home at the end of the day, follow my advice. Threaten a cop. He doesn't care what the color of your skin is. He cares about the threat that you're opposing. And that's what the research showed. You are five times more likely to die if you have a weapon and you brandish that weapon in front of a police officer, regardless of your skin color. Those that do die is a deviance. It's a statistical deviance. The 11 African Americans and the 29 white people that were killed by police in 2019 without a weapon is a statistical deviance. It's not the norm. It's not the way things go. There's a reactivist deviance is the second. And this deviance, whether a social audience reacts against as deviant, something that elicits no reaction, escapes identification of deviance. Okay, so the masses have determined that killing people by police is a deviant action and they are reacting to that. They're saying that all death and all killing by police is deviant and they're reacting. If there is no reaction, there is no identification that it is deviant. If we decide, if we opened up these doors and there were people walking down the hallway naked, how would we react? If we didn't react, it's not deviant. The reason why I keep opening my phone is so I can check the chat to see if there's any questions. I'm not being rude. Okay, the absolutist deviance. This results from value judgments based on absolute standards of black and white. Okay. My world, my personal world, I have a code of ethics that I live by. And there is a code of ethics that I judge everybody else by. I'm sure you guys have your own. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not this. Thou shalt not that. Thou shalt not have relationships with your professor. Your professor shall not have relationships with you. There's an absolute standard in a line that's drawn. Anything that is outside of that line is considered deviant. Okay. And then there's normative deviance. And that's the label depends on the group's notion or actions and their conditions. And the conditions that are associated. Okay. This is situational. And this is a concept that can change from different positions. It follows the hedonistic calculus. And hedonistic calculus establishes morality and it establishes what is deviant based upon where you are. I think the Bible says somewhere when in Rome, do as the Romans do? No, the Bible doesn't say that. But that's a proverb that we know, right? When in Rome, do as the Romans do. So if we went to New Mexico, any, anybody from New Mexico? What's one of the things that really surprised me when I went to New Mexico? We'll get back to New Mexico in a minute was the nudist camps and all of the nudity in New Mexico. And we'll get back to the nudity question here in a minute. So factual, he's lying. Can you prove that he's lying? Can you prove that it's raining? Can it, if it is a factual judgment, it can be proven by science. It can be verified by science. It is objective. Everybody should agree on that science. It's supported by evidence. The fact does not depend on who believes it. A fact doesn't care if anybody believes it. A fact is a fact. It's supported by scientific evidence. And I like it just is. 
a fact is. It's a fact I have brown eyes. Can I change that? I can put in colored contacts, yes. And then you would see white eyes or blue eyes or green eyes or whatever eyes I want you to see. But what color are my eyes? They're brown. My hair is going gray. Can I hide that fact? I can hide it, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm old and getting older every single day. Now, a value, a value judgment is he or she is a good person. No, they're not such a good person. It's subjective and it's based upon your own personal opinion. In your research and the papers that you write for me throughout your college career, because I plan to still be here when you guys graduate with your master's degree. I don't care what you think. What do you know? What are the facts? In discussion posts, don't put, I think, I believe. Because those are poor judgments. What's the fact? The social control theory is, we see the social control theory going in full force right now. Social control theory says that we will use peer pressure, we will use society, and we will use outside forces to control your behavior. And what's the biggest sign and the biggest validation of social control, social control theory working today in America? Everybody's wearing a mask. I got an email today, you know, I used to wear one of the balaclavas. I don't know if you saw me around in public. I've got a whole bunch of really cool balaclavas. I spent almost $100 on those masks. They're now prohibited on campus. Did you know that if you see somebody outside of the classroom, you know, not counting professors inside the classroom who are lecturing, but if you see somebody walking down the hall and they are not wearing a mask, a surgical mask or a mask like this, they want you to send an email to COVID-19 at utpb.edu and turn them in. Did you know that if you see somebody not wearing this mask correctly, you're supposed to Send an email, turn them in. That being said, I'm not going to wear your mask. Some people have a hard time breathing. So if you need to stick your nose out, stick your nose out. It's okay. For me, when you go out in the hallway, cover your nose. I bet you that people in this country wouldn't care if you're walking around bare ass naked, as long as you got a mask on your face. You remember going to Walmart last fall? You couldn't leave Walmart without showing your receipt because the biggest threat to Walmart was people stealing. Nobody cares if you paid for anything that you bring out. Nobody asks for your receipt anymore. What do they worry about? You're wearing a mask and that you have a mask on. Social control theory is an absolute ingenious way to control what you're doing to control what a society does. So, one of my favorite topics, one of the things that I did as a profiler with the prison system is I read tattoos. So if you have a tattoo and you catch me looking at you or staring at your tattoo, it's because I'm reading it. Okay. Because every tattoo, how many of you have tattoos? I really like the ones on the inside of the wrist. <laughs> Sorry. Um, every tattoo has a story, right? Did you just get something printed on your body 
for the sake of printing it on your body? Or does it mean something? And it represents something. Okay. So when I was growing up and within my social structure, tattoos are taboo. Um, in my world, I cannot be buried in a Jewish cemetery if I have a tattoo, meaning I'm not going to get a tattoo. If I really, really, really want one, you've seen the tattoos where the skin is kind of ripped open and there's an American flag underneath it. I want one of those on this sleeve. And then I want the same thing over here with the Israeli flag. I think that'd be really cool. But every time I think about going and doing that, what happens? My social control says, no, you can't do that because you'll have to be buried with the non-Jews. Yes, I'm that much of an elitist. But I won't be able to be buried with my family if I have a tattoo, according to my, the social controls that are in my life. In the 1950s, who had tattoos? specifically the Navy, some army, special forces get tattoos. Who else get tattoos? Bikers, one percenters, and inmates. There are cultures on our planet, especially the Pacific Islanders, where tattooing is a rite of passage. It's a rite of manhood. You can't, you're not a man until you've spent 17 hours getting these tribal tattoos placed on you. Like this one right here. It's a symbol of manhood. But our standards of decency have changed over the decades. Now people get tattoos and, you know, it's no big thing. Look, you know, Adam Levine, oh, disgusting man. Um, I'm sorry if you're a fan of Adam Levine, but why in the hell does he need to put a tattoo of California across his ass? Well, I'm from California is what he answered. I said, yeah, but don't you know that's what the gangbangers do? I've got the next slide of tattoos. Um, cause these are all acceptable, right? Anything wrong with these tattoos? You see anything wrong with them? Tribals. This guy is a Philadelphia Eagles fan. Pretty flowers. Um, the heartbeat, keeping in health, keeping living, the anti-suicide tattoos. These are all statements that we make. The all seeing eye. Christianity. What about those tattoos? At which point did tattoos become deviant? Yes, that's a penis tattooed to the side of his head. And I don't know what this woman's done to herself. The occult and Satanism. MS-13. Why would somebody do that to themselves? Is there a point where tattoos become deviant? This guy had to have been passed out, drunk, stoned, something. And his best friend did this to him. There's no way that this was something he wanted, is there? This guy was on Facebook before I got rid of my Facebook complaining that he can't get a job. I'm sure she can't get one either. For those of you that have tattoos, I was told that tattoos are kind of addic addictive. Once you get one, you want to get more and more and more. Is that accurate? Yeah. Would you want any of those? I don't think I would.
All is a riddle. And the key to a riddle is just another riddle. My kids always complain. They go, why do you answer every question with a question? My common answer is because I'm Jewish. We don't know how to answer a question. Because life is a riddle. Everything in life is a riddle. Everything that we do is a riddle. Which brings up a riddle. At birth, I walk in four legs. My adolescence, I walk on two legs. In old age, I walk on three legs. What am I? A man. Well, what the hell is a man? Do we know anymore? Public nudity. Is that deviant? All these pictures I took in New Mexico. You can walk through the national forests. Uh, this bottom picture of all these people is at a um, place called Shakespeare Hot Springs in the Gila National Forest. Have you ever been? Lots of nudity. You run into people and they're not wearing any clothes. Why? Free spirits. That's their way of going against the norm. A way of going against the norm, a way of showing that, hey, I'm me, it's individualism. This is natural. It's natural for us to be this way. This is the way God created us. And God created me to be naked. We see somebody walking down the hall in Texas, we see somebody running around naked. What do we do? Tell them put some clothes on. Call a cop. I was hiking through the Gila National Forest and bumped into a young man. All he was wearing was a leather holster with his firearm stand in it. And I go, in one case, I would come across a snake. Oh, okay. But when you're running around and you're hiking through the forest, the national forest in New Mexico, you've got to be extremely careful, uh, especially when you're hiking with a 10 year old. He was 10 at the time, he's 12 now. Do we allow or do we accept public nudity with children? If you notice here, that's her child. This hot springs is actually up near Albuquerque. What do you think? You think we should start running around naked? Is it deviant? These people don't think nudity is deviant. They let me take their picture. Truth or consequences, New Mexico. They've got public baths. Everybody just goes, gets naked, and gets in a tub. I don't know how it works since COVID started or if all of those things are closed. I know the hot springs down in Big Bend is closed. You can't go there. You can't be naked there either. But what's deviant? Is this deviant? Is this acceptable? They're all consenting adults, right? Well, except for that one picture, except for this picture. There's a kid there, and there's a kid there. I would consider that deviant. They thought it was okay. I guess it comes in terms of the measure you're measuring it to. So if you measure it to the state, where it's totally fine, it's not deviant. If you measure it to the other 49 states, where we think it's a little taboo, then it's deviant. Right. Again, it's set by, it, deviance is set by society. Deviance is also set by our reaction. If nobody reacts to it and we just ignore it, it's not deviant behavior. It's acceptable. You've heard the expression. 
silence is violence. I don't know that I'm supporting it or not, but this is what's, what Deviant says. If you are not speaking out against an activity or a behavior, you're accepting it as normal. As a profiler, where do you stand? And I am really, really, really quick today. So, with my time that I have left, I think I'm going to ask you guys a question. How do you define deviance? Or what do you see as deviant? Yes, sir. Me, um, people that aren't respectful, because in my, my personal world, that's, that's priority number one. Is respect. respect. So somebody who's disrespectful, doesn't matter what else they do, they're still deviant. I could be a nice guy. I give money to all kinds of people. But I don't acknowledge anybody's presence. That's not very respectful. Any other ideas or any other thoughts on deviance? I feel like it really just depends on the way you're brought up. Like I was brought up Southern Baptist, so tattoos and piercings and dancing and things like that were all a sin. So that's how I based my deviance until I got older. But if you weren't raised like that, then your deviance is based off of what society tells you or what your parents told you. Or it all just depends on your, so to say, moral compass. And your moral compass is set by the way you were raised and established. So as a profiler, you become the compass holder. I want to talk about one of my most favorite serial killers of all time. He's actually fictional. His name is Dexter. You guys like Dexter? How'd you like the ending of Dexter? I didn't watch it because I was afraid he was going to get caught. Well, you can go watch it. He doesn't get caught. I'm going to spoil it for you. He retires. Maybe depending on the way that you look at his eyes. As you go through the last season of Dexter, he's, he tells you about his dark passenger and you know how he's learning to control his dark passenger and all of this stuff. And he drives off into the hurricane and then ends up somewhere in the Northwest or Alaska chopping down trees. And then he cuts into a steak and it gets bloody and then his eyes twinkle. So I guess they left it open to bring Dexter back if they ever want to. Was Dexter an ethical serial killer? Because he, he, he was a very popular serial killer. Yes, I know, he was fictional. He was a fictional character, but he was a serial killer that only killed people that needed to die or that he judged that needed to die because the justice system failed. So he thinks he's above society, above justice, and he will take out his own vengeance based on what he believed to be deviant or not. So is he a good guy or a bad guy? It made sense to me from both sides because I, the way I was raised as a Christian, murder is bad. But on the same token, he's getting rid of the scum of the earth. So it just kind of depends on how you were raised. So for me, like he's both good and bad. Uh -huh. 
it also comes down to whether or not you understand the game. You, nope. can, you can be the nicest person on the planet and love everybody, but if you something happens to you that dramatically changes your life and you understand hate now, it opens up a whole new world of thoughts and emotions. Because what he was doing wasn't based out of hate, right? Right. But you, to understand why you would want to kill somebody or understand why somebody thought somebody else needs to be killed, you need to understand all of your emotions. There was a quote that I used last night in my death penalty class. It's a quote from Moses in the Bible. It says, any person that takes the life of another human shall not live or shall not be allowed to live. So Dexter only killed murderers well, and rapists. And, you know, there's a biblical standpoint. Dexter only killed those people that God in the Bible sentenced to die. And the standard set by Moses is two witnesses. So the people Dexter killed were murderers, rapists, kidnappers, and false serial killers. You know, James Edward Olmos, you know, he killed him because he wasn't a proper serial killer. Um, so there's an argument, you know, it depends on where, you, where you're standing. Yeah. What Dexter did and how he killed these people, cut them up, put them in the trash bags, and dropped them in the coral off the coast of Florida. And that was pretty bad. You know, in the end of the first season, you know, they show that underwater picture of all those garbage bags, like how many people he'd killed. That's what we do as profilers. Most of us, as profilers, want to chase the serial and serious offender. There's a BBC show called John Luther. It's called Luther, starring John Luther and Edris Alba is the main star. You guys seen that show? It's on Stars. It's on Netflix. It's on BBC America. Uh, interesting show. He's kind of crooked himself. At which point do we accept people to break the rules to enforce our Ideas of justice. That's not going to work right. Okay, I lose. That's an investigative tool. As a profiler and an investigator, you ask a question. Then you just sit there and wait. It's supposed to create an uncomfortable situation, an uncomfortable silence to where it will make somebody talk and say something. And I decided that I don't have that much time to wait for it to break one of you. Any questions? If I were to let you guys go 15 minutes early, would you complain? No complaints about going now. Okay. 
Have a good day. I'll see you next week. Please stay safe. Can we just email you on Canvas? Email me on Canvas or through Canvas with the secret code word for today. Sarah Lowe is now exiting.